Hello everyone. Uh, we are going to be solving a problem on uh, average normal and uh, average shear stress uh, this time. Uh, so we will first uh, set up the problem as uh, follows. Uh, so I have the following structure. Okay. Uh, here is the structure. So I have a bar uh, AB and uh, this bar is uh, pin connected to a wall at uh, the point A. And uh, there is a uh, another bar uh, BC uh, which is attached uh, to the bar AB as uh, shown. Okay. So this is the bar BC which is uh, pinned at the end of the bar uh, AB uh, right there, and then uh, this end here is uh, connected to the wall by means of another pin. And uh, so uh, bar AB and BC are two. Uh, members of uh, you'll see that this is going to be a frame uh, very soon uh, there are two members which are pin connected at the point B so this is the point A then this is B and then this is C and then uh, we have some dimensions given to us our distance from uh, point A to point C height wise is uh, 3 meters and uh, distance from uh, A to B is uh, 4 meters or distance from A to C is also 4 meters. C and A are along the uh, uh, the same uh, line. Uh, B to C is 4 meters. So that we have a nice uh, 3, 4, 5 slope triangle. So I have a pin at this point. I have a pin at this point connected to the wall here. And then I have that connected to the wall at uh, point A as well. And then I have a pin connecting two bars, uh, A, B and uh, B, C. And then on this bar AB, I have a distributed force um, as uh, shown. This is a rectangular distributed loading acting on the bar AB alone. And uh, this rectangular distributed loading has an intensity of uh, Q. All right. And uh, so we have the dimensions given to us and uh, we have this rectangular load of intensity Q uh, the magnitude of this uh, load distribution is uh, not given to us the load intensity for Q is not given to us and uh, uh, one of the things that we need to find in this problem is the uh, magnitude of the load intensity uh, but the following information is given to us there are two cuts that are made on the bar BC so here is the first cut and uh, this is uh, called as uh, section AA and then I have a second cut uh, which is made um, at the center of uh, bar BC but the uh, cut is going to be in the vertical direction uh, so the cut at uh, BC we will call this as uh, BB so this is uh, the section uh, BB okay so on bar BC uh, two cuts are made on bar BC we have section AA and uh, this section AA is uh, perpendicular to the length of BC and then I have a section BB which is vertical and the following information is known about uh, the uh, uh, stresses along these uh, sections so we are told that uh, the the failure stress along uh, section AA is uh, in terms of the normal stress and this is given to us as uh, 200 megapascals with a factor of safety of 2. So if at section AA the failure stress is uh, the normal stress so sigma fail is given to us as 200 megapascals the factor of safety for sigma is given to us as uh, 2 and then if at section BB the failure stress is uh, dictated in terms of the shear stress so tau fail is uh, given to us as 230 megapascals and then the factor of safety with respect to the shear stress is given to us as 3 and uh, if these are the two uh, failure values given to us then we need to find the limiting value of Q Okay, so the question is uh, find the limiting value of Q. Where Q is the load intensity. Okay. 
and uh, this has to satisfy the information that is uh, known in terms of the failure stresses all right so this has to satisfy this information and it also has to satisfy uh, that information so the failure stress is given to us in terms of the normal stress in terms of the shear stress at two different sections aa and bb uh, we know the factor of safety as well on these uh, two cuts uh, for these two failure stresses our aim is to find out uh, what the limiting value of q is right and uh, the idea is that uh, uh, whatever value of uh, q that we're going to choose uh, the structure BC or the bar BC should not fail either due to the normal stress or due to the shear stress. Uh, so we need to perhaps find the uh, lowest of the uh, uh, limiting values that we obtain from uh, the failure stresses as uh, shown in the problem. Alright, so here is the problem once again. I have a bar AB, I have a bar BC. The bar AB and the bar BC are pin connected at the point B. I have the bar AB pinned to the wall at A. I have the bar BC pinned to the wall at C. It is quite obviously seen that this is not a truss, which means that this has to be a frame. And uh, we are told that on the bar AB, a load distribution whose intensity is Q is uh, given to us in the form of a rectangular load distribution. Then we are told further that uh, there are two sections that are uh, the sections of interest on the bar BC. Along section AA, which is perpendicular to the length of BC, the failure normal stress and the factor of safety are given to us. Along the section BB, which is completely vertical, the failure stress uh, is uh, given to us in terms of the shear stress and the factor of safety for uh, shear is also given to us. And uh, one thing that we will do in this problem is we will neglect any cross-sectional changes uh, due to the nature of the cuts. Okay, uh, So this is uh, something that will be left uh, unsaid. Uh, we, will, uh, we will write that statement somewhere here. Uh, so neglect. cross-section changes due to the cuts and uh, we can see uh, that uh, the uh, uh, values that we get uh, if we consider the cross-sections properly is uh, very very close to the values that we get by neglecting the cross-sectional changes uh, one important piece of uh, information given to us is the diameter of the bar BC uh, so the diameter of the bar uh, BC is given to us as uh, phi. So phi of BC is uh, 20 millimeters. And uh, this is the diameter of the bar BC, which means that the cross section of uh, BC has to be a circle. Alright, so this is all the information that's given to us. Uh, we need to find out uh, the limiting value of the force Q. Uh, quite obviously this is a frame uh, since this is a frame and we see that uh, one of the first things that we typically think of uh, when we look at a frame is can I find all the support reactions and is it even necessary or is it even useful uh, in this situation I am focusing only on the bar BC uh, so which means that it is sufficient for me to find only the force along the bar BC and furthermore you see that uh, the bar BC has a force at the point C it has a force at the point B which means that BC is a two force member if BC is a two-force member and I know that uh, the point B, I have the bar AB and BC connected together, there are no other forces on the point B, on the pin B, which means that the forces at the two points uh, on bar AB and BC must be equal and opposite. Alright, so I'm going to draw the free body diagrams of the bar BC and the bar AB. Once again, not a great idea to find the support reactions at A and C because we really cannot uh, by drawing the free body diagram of the entire frame. Uh, it is not very really useful. Uh, and I'm, I need to focus only on the bar BC, so it is not in my best interest to find the support reactions at A. Alright, uh, so let's draw the free body diagram of uh, uh, BC and uh, AB. Uh, here we go. Usually we get rid of the distributed loading uh, by replacing it by a single equivalent force which is acting at uh, the uh, geometric uh, center or has a line of action passing through the uh, uh, geometric center of the distributed load. Uh, so here is the bar AB. And uh, here is the bar BC. And uh, we know that uh, there is a nice slope triangle 3, 4 and 5. If you look at the previous figure, uh, you see that the vertical is 3, the horizontal is 4. Uh, which means that if I draw a slope triangle, then that's going to be 3, 4 and 5. Uh, so we have a slope triangle that dictates the bar BC. Uh, so we can draw this as a 3, 
four, five uh, slope triangle. Um, then we're going to look at uh, the support reactions uh, at the point A. I'm going to have an AX and an AY. Of course, uh, we are not worried about that. Uh, BC is a two force member, so this is the point B, this is the point C. So I'm going to have an FBC and an FBC. And this is also FBC. I'm going to take FBC, split it into its components. There is going to be one on the horizontal, one on the vertical. Uh, let's do that uh, for um, the point B alone here because uh, that is. Uh, of more interest to us than the point C. Uh, so this is uh, four set BC, uh, three fifths and four fifths. Uh, so this is going to be four fifths FBC and three fifths FBC. All right. Uh, so which means at the point B on the bar AB, I'm going to have equal and opposite FBC. So that's going to be. Um, I can just draw them in terms of these uh, two components. Uh, uh, so that's going to be the following. So I have three fifths, and then this is pointing to the right. So I'm going to have a component pointing to the left. So this is going to be four fifths FBC, and uh, this is going to be three fifths FBC. All right. Uh, then I have uh, the uh, distributed load acting on the bar AB. So I have to take care of that. Uh, these are the bars. I know the diameter of the bar uh, uh, BC is given to me, so we will also make a note of that. Diameter is uh, 20 millimeters. And uh, so the distributed force uh, acting on the bar uh, AB, so I first draw it as a dotted line because I know that there was a distributed force acting on it, and I'm going to replace it by a single equivalent force, this is a rectangle, so passing through its centroid, I have a force whose magnitude is going to be equal to the area of the rectangle. Look at the previous figure. Distance from A to B is uh, 4 meters, and then I have uh, the value of uh, Q here, which is unknown to me, but that's the height of the rectangle. So the area of the rectangle is 4 times Q. Acts halfway between A and B, so this is going to be 4 times Q, and then distance is uh, 2 meters each ways and uh, once again here that's also two meters all right so we have all the free body diagrams drawn uh, this is bc that's ab this is a two force member at these two points the forces are equal and opposite as you can see here and um, if, if you really want you can also show the force fbc acting right there equal and opposite to the point b but we haven't shown it in terms of its components here Okay, so our aim is to find the force FBC because BC is the bar that all the information is given on. Uh, so I'm going to focus on the bar AB. I need to find FBC, so summation of forces is of not much use. So I'm going to sum moments about the point A. Alright, so on bar AB, we're going to sum moments about the point A, set them equal to zero. So this is the statics part. If I look at that, I have 3 fifths FBC produces a moment that is in the clockwise direction. So that's going to be minus 3 fifths FBC times a distance of 4. And then the 4Q produces a moment that is counterclockwise. So that's going to be 4Q times a distance of 2 meters. All of these set together equal to 0, which means that if I can solve for FBC, I find that FBC is um, the factor of 4 can be cancelled off and then the 3 fifths um, when you flip it out it becomes a 5 thirds times a 2 so that's going to be 10 by 3 Q and our expectation is uh, this is going to be in so many newtons which means that Q is uh, typically going to have units of uh, newton per meter uh, if it becomes a large number then we can say it's kilonewtons per meter or mega newtons per meter alright uh, so what we are doing here is we are acting as if we know the value of the force Q and then we are finding the force along the bar BC in terms of the uh, force Q and uh, why are we interested in BC this is because all the information uh, given to us in the problem pertains to the bar BC okay uh, so we have the bar BC, uh, we have the force along this bar BC, uh, which is uh, 10 by 3Q. Now I'm going to redraw the bar BC and look at the cuts that we are interested in. All right. Uh, so here is the bar uh, BC. Right. 
to bar BC and uh, we see that the bar BC is in a state of uh, compression and this makes perfect sense because there is a force pushing down on the bar AB and BC acts as uh, some kind of a support structure. Uh, so bar BC then I have the force uh, on either ends uh, 10 by 3 Q so this is F BC which is 10 Q by 3 and uh, similarly F B C. Now there are two cuts that we are interested in. Right? The first cut is going to be perpendicular to the length of uh, BC so that's going to be uh, section AA. Right? Uh, so we are looking at section AA first and uh, if you go back to the problem AA uh, look at the problem here so AA is going to be perpendicular to the length of the bar BC so we're going to cut it that way uh, so here is the section AA, it does not matter where we cut it and uh, as we cut through the section AA I can either look at the top piece or the bottom piece I'm going to be looking at uh, the bottom piece, I'm going to take this piece out and then draw its free body diagram and as I'm cutting through a bar I know that there are some internal uh, forces present in 2D there are internal normal forces and internal shear forces and internal bending moments as well uh, so here is the cut piece Right, and uh, here is the section that we uh, have, section AA. So that's AA. Then I have the bar BC, the force on the bar BC, as you can see, is uh, going to be 10 Q by 3. Uh, so we can mark that out right here. So that's FBC. And Q by 3 and then uh, you see that uh, since this is a straight two force member there is going to be no internal bending moments uh, this is uh, this makes common sense as we've discussed in class and also you see that uh, since the cut at AA is uh, normal to the bar BC the only internal force that's going to be exposed at that portion is the internal normal force along the section AA and it's going to be perpendicular to the cut and I know that since the bar BC is in compression the normal force is going to be putting the bar BC in compression as well so right away we just uh, draw the normal force along the section AA so this is going to be N AA and from force balance uh, if I decide to choose this as my um, x-axis and uh, I can choose to call this as my uh, y-axis and uh, that would be my positive quadrant uh, so from force balance I know that forces along the x-axis is equal to zero and uh, this gives me N AA is equal to F B C or the normal force along the section AA is 10 Q by 3. Right. Uh, so we have the normal force along the section AA and uh, we are told that there is a normal stress that is acting on the section AA. So let's take a look at what's happening there. So normal force at section AA is known to us. Uh, now I'm going to draw this uh, uh, the cut piece uh, that you saw on the previous page. I'm going to draw it in a slightly uh, larger uh, viewpoint as you will see here. Okay, so still section A. We know that the normal force is 10 Q by 3 and compression because the bar BC is in a state of compression. Uh, so if I look at uh, the uh, cut that we looked at in the previous page. Uh, so here is the cut and uh, here is the bar BC, the rest of the bar BC and uh, I have the force acting on the other piece, um, look at that um, so if I draw the three dimensional cross section here I have the force FBC which is pushing on it uh, from here so that's the force FBC which we know 10 Q by 3 and then I have NBC which is acting right there or N N N A B N A A, which, which is what we decided to call it but it's on the bar BC uh, so we are not wrong in saying it that way as well uh, now here is the area of cross section alright so that's the area of cross section that I'm interested in now on that uh, area I'm going to draw 
an area element and uh, we want to look at the state of stress. We want to see whether this is a tensile or a compressive stress. It common sense tells me that this is going to be a compressive stress. Right? So I'm first going to draw an area element or a surface element. Uh, look at the surface element there. So we draw the surface element. On this surface element I know that the stress is going to be in the same direction as NAA because we have the formula sigma AA is uh, going to be NAA by the area at that cut. Uh, so this is the area of cross section that we have at that cut. Uh, we, can, we can show that here. This is AAA and uh, this is also going to be a compressive uh, stress. Uh, so the first thing we do is we mark the direction of the stress. That's going to be in the same direction as NAA. So that's going to be sigma AA. And uh, then we want to draw the state of stress on a volume element. Uh, so I'm going to take that uh, uh, piece that we see here. And then uh, let us draw this uh, from a three-dimensional point of view. So we are drawing the state of stress on the volume element. Right, and uh, this is the side that uh, we are seeing. Right, I'm going to mark it on the uh, neon. So that's, that's what we are seeing there. And on that particular side, we know that the stress is uh, pushing down. Um, so that's going to be sigma AA. which means that in order to balance this uh, volume element, I'm going to have a sigma AA which is acting on the bottom side as well. Uh, so the side, uh, the bottom side is this one here. So on that particular side, I'm going to have a sigma AA pushing up equal and opposite to the sigma AA that we have. And this is a compressive state of stress. Preserve normal stress, and this is the state of stress on a volume element. Right, and that's uh, so why I know normal force in terms of uh, Q. I know the area of cross section. The area of cross section is that of a circle. Uh, so area AA is uh, pi r square or this is pi by 4 times phi square where phi is the diameter. Uh, so we have the area of cross section. I have the uh, normal force in terms of Q. Uh, so here is what we are going to do. Uh, we are going to now establish the uh, limiting value of uh, sigma AA. So the limiting value of uh, sigma AA has to be the maximum allowable stress that is permissible on that particular section. Uh, so sigma AA has to be equal to sigma allowable but sigma allowable is sigma fail divided by the factor of safety for sigma. Uh, we were given sigma fail in the problem to be 200 megapascals. The factor of safety was uh, 2. Uh, so this is going to be 200 divided by 2. So many megapascals or 100 megapascals uh, was the limiting value. Uh, so this means that sigma AA is 100 megapascals. This is the limiting value. Right. Uh, since this is a limiting value and uh, since we also know that sigma AA can be related to NAA, uh, we have the following. Sigma AA is NAA by the area of cross section, uh, which means that sigma AA, which was 100 megapascals, has to be equal to NAA, which is 10Q by 3 by the area of cross section pi by 4 times phi square. Now we start substituting the values. We want to be consistent to the units. Whenever I see a megapascal, I multiply that by 10 to the power 6. And so I have 100 times 10 to the power 6 megapascals converted into pascals. Pascals is newtons per meter square. This is going to be a force divided by the area of cross section pi by 4 times 
0.02 square. And so since the numerator is a force, Q has to have units of uh, Newton per meter. So that the entire numerator gives me a force. I'm multiplying it by a distance uh, in order to find the moments when we found out FBC. So I get that to be uh, equal to Newtons. Uh, so the entire thing works out well. So this is going to be in terms of Newtons. And this is going to be in meter square. So the units match. And then if I find out the value of Q, I'm going to get the following. So after solving, Q, which I'm going to call based on sigma, is uh, going to give me 9420 approximately. Newton per meter or Q based on sigma is 9.42 kilonewton per meter. So this is a limiting value based on the uh, maximum normal stress. Now we have to do exactly the same thing uh, by looking at the limiting value in terms of the maximum uh, allowable shear stress and then we have to pick and choose from the two uh, values of Q that we obtain uh, based on uh, the sigma limits and based on the uh, tau limits. Alright, so once again, limiting value of sigma AA was a failure by the factor of safety value and that's equal to the allowable value of 100 megapascals. But by definition or by what we derived in class, the average normal stress is the internal normal force by the area of cross section. And based on that, we can find out Q as 9.42 kilonewtons per meter. But we are not yet done, right, because we still have the shear stresses to contend with. Alright, so taking a look at the shear stresses, uh, uh, which means that we have to look at the section BB, uh, getting a little ahead of myself here. Uh, so I'm going to look at section BB. Uh, BB. Uh, so once we look at section BB, I'm going to draw the uh, two force member, uh, which we had at the beginning. Right, so this was the uh, bar BC. Um, we had uh, the force acting on it so that uh, this is in a state of uh, uh, compression. So FBC and FBC and FBC was uh, 10Q by 3 and then the cut at uh, BB was the following. It was a purely vertical cut so this was the cut at uh, BB. And uh, so once uh, we have the cut at BB, I'm going to take one of the pieces, uh, let me take the piece uh, from the bottom, redraw the free body diagram and then focus on the information that we need. Alright, so here is a free body diagram of that cut segment. Uh, so first of all, I have the cut and then I have the rest of uh, the bar BC. I'm just going to draw it in a slightly uh, larger manner here. Uh, it's, a, it's an exaggerated uh, figure of course. And then I have BC. BC had uh, the slope triangle 3, 4 and 5. Uh, don't forget. So that's 3, 4 and 5. And so I'm going to take BC which, is, which will be acting uh, this way. So that's FBC. I'm going to split it into a component this way. So that's going to be 4 fifths FBC and uh, 3 fifths F. BC. So these will be the components. But then on the section that we have exposed, so this is section uh, BB as, as I will be drawing here. So this is uh, section BB. So on that section I'm going to have two forces that are going to go show up. Uh, first of all notice that this is still a straight two force member which means that it does not have any internal bending moments. If you don't have a straight two force member then that is something else that we have to work with. Uh, for this problem we don't need to worry about that. Um, Look at the section BB, I'm going to have a normal force. Um, I'm just going to look at uh, the direction of the 4 fifths FBC. I know the normal force has to be pushing into the section uh, BB. So this is going to be the normal force at section BB. I know there is a shear force at section BB which is going to be parallel to the cut. Just look at the direction, the force at this point is pointing up which means that based on uh, common sense or force balance, this shear force here which is VBB has to be pointing down. And so from force balance I see that VBB I'm told or I can find out that uh, VBB is 3 fifths FBC but FBC is 10 Q by 3 which is uh, 3 fifths times 10 Q by 3 which means that VBB is equal to Q. Now, why are we not interested in NBB? 
This is because on the section BB I am given only tau, right? Which means that I need the shear force to calculate the shear stress. Uh, so the information given is uh, tau fail on BB is given to me as 230 megapascals. The factor of safety in shear is given to me as 3. This is the information given for BB, so uh, which is why we are interested only in VBB and we do not have any interest in NBB at all uh, because we don't have any information based on the normal forces, normal stresses on uh, uh, the uh, section BB. So I have this information. I'm just going to redraw this uh, from a slightly uh, better perspective. In the next page, I'm going to draw the same cut. I want to look at the state of stress uh, on a volume element before we proceed ahead with some calculations. Alright, so here is the cut. Uh, here is the section BB, first of all. And uh, I'm going to have uh, the rest of the bar BC. Alright. Uh, so this is uh, bar BC with the force FBC acting on it. So this is FBC. I know that uh, components of FBC act this way and act that way, which means that on this piece I know the direction of the uh, shear force. Uh, the shear force VBB we know is acting down. Right. So that's going to be. VBB. I'm not worried about NBB because I, I don't have any information on NBB. Now I'm going to look at a small area element. Uh, I'm going to draw the area element. Um, as you can see, this is first of all taken as a rectangle, and on that rectangle, I know that there's going to be a shear stress. And uh, by definition of what we've done in class, tau BB is the average shear stress, which is the average shear force divided by the area of cross section. Right, uh, so the area of cross section is this entire area that we are looking at. So that's going to be area of cross section APB. And then if I look at the direction of tau, you see that it has to be in the same direction as V. Right, so I mark the direction of tau first. So it's going to be pointing down, and uh, this is going to be tau. BB and then I take that piece out. I want to draw the state of stress on a volume element. I take that out and then I draw the following. I have a cube now. And I draw the remaining side of the cube, the dotted sides here. And I see that uh, first of all the side that I view, this one here, the shaded side, is this uh, side that I'm shading here and on that particular side I have the shear stress direction tau BB is pointing straight down here which means that I need to have something on the opposite side to balance it which means that uh, from force balance I see that if this is pointing down then on the opposite face I'm going to have something that is going to be pointing upwards Right, so that's also going to be tau BB. But then you see that if I have two forces, one going up and the other coming down, and they are separated by small distance, they almost create a couple moment, which means that this couple moment is trying to rotate uh, the entire thing uh, through an axis coming out of the front page, which means that I need to balance it. So on the top face, I'm going to have something. Then on the bottom face, I'm going to have something which are equal to the shear stresses on all the other faces. So you see that this is going to be tau BB, that's going to be tau BB, that's also tau BB, and this is the one that we started off with, and this is called the complementary property of shear. Complementary property of shear stress. That is, I have a transverse shear causing a longitudinal shear. So this is a longitudinal shear. This is a transverse shear. They are two perpendicular directions. So if I have one, I have the other. Right? So transverse shear causes a longitudinal shear. And vice versa. The double implication implies that if I have a longitudinal shear, then I have a transverse shear as well. All right. Uh, so I have uh, the state of stress on a volume element. This is the state of stress on a volume element. At uh, 
BB, but you have to keep in mind that we are considering only the shear force. There is also going to be the normal force. If I did include the normal force, uh, then the normal force would be pointing uh, in this direction, which will be pushing on uh, the uh, face that I view, uh, which means that on this uh, area element, I'm also going to have a normal stress, which will be pushing in, which means that I'm going to have a normal stress pushing in here on this face and then so I'm going to have something equal and opposite pushing on the back face right so I'm going to have a sigma BB and a sigma BB as well and uh, but we are not interested in the sigma BB uh, this is because there is no information given to us on this particular sigma and so this is the uh, phase that is opposite to that particular phase that's going to be sigmas on either phases uh, so I look at uh, tau BB right so tau BB is VBB by area uh, BB. Now we are asked to neglect area of cross section changes. Uh, the reason for this is uh, if I take an area which is circular and then if I slice through it vertically then I create an ellipse. Right? So this is actually not a circular area. This is an ellipse. But the error introduced by uh, using uh, the actual cross section as an ellipse rather than as a circle is very minimal, so we are going to neglect uh, those uh, particular changes. Uh, so VBB is going to be 2Q, and then I am going to have uh, ABB, uh, which is the area of cross section, so pi by 4 times phi square, where phi is the diameter of the uh, portion AB. This is an approximation. Um, this is uh, an approximation, something to keep in mind, uh, but then we go back uh, to the question. Alright, so we have all these things, we go back to the question, the question is giving us uh, how fail at uh, section BB. Uh, so using that information, I see that uh, if I want to find limiting value of uh, tau BB, tau BB is going to be tau allowable the maximum permissible value which is going to be tau fail by the factor of safety for tau and this is for section BB and this is going to be 230 by 3 megapascals 230 was the failure stress shear stress given to us 3 was a factor of safety and so I have the following now uh, so tau BB which is 230 by 3 megapascals is going to be VBB by ABB, I'm just going to start substituting. So 230 by 3, 10 to the power 6, so many newtons, meter square is 2Q. Q is going to be in newtons per meter, but multiplication by means of distance makes this entire thing as newtons. Area of cross section, 5 by 4, 0.02 square, there will be in meter square, so my units are consistent. If I solve for Q, and I'm going to call this as Q from tau because we are using the limiting value of tau. And uh, the value that I'm going to get is uh, 12,041 Newton per meter, of course approximate. Or Q based on tau is 12.04 kilonewton per meter. So, what did we do? We said that uh, we go back to the uh, section at BB. We know that the state of stress uh, is uh, dictated by the shear stress because that's a limiting value that's given to us. Uh, so we say that okay, shear stress is shear force with the area of cross section, approximate the area of cross section, and then we go back and then find uh, the value of Q uh, based on the limitations imposed on the shear stress. Now we have two values of Q. If you go back uh, a couple of pages ahead uh, uh, or earlier, uh, you had a value of Q based on uh, sigma. Uh, so from section AA, if you look at the value of Q, Q sigma was uh, 9.42 kilonewtons per meter. From section BB, the limiting value of Q was 12.04 uh, kilonewton per meter, which means that for the entire bar, I have to choose a value of Q such that the bar does not fail either due to shear or due to normal stresses, which means obviously that I have to choose the smaller of these two candidate values. Uh, so, to prevent failure by either normal or shear stresses, 
at either section we choose the lower value which means that Q is Q sigma or 9.42 kilonewton per meter and the reality check is if I take the value of Q and uh, so you see that uh, if I calculate tau BB if I take the value of Q Q sigma times 2 divided by ABB you will find that this will be less than tau allowable which means that it satisfies no failure and it's quite obvious that since I used Q from the sigma, there will be no failure for the sigma as well. Alright, uh, so uh, we go back to the uh, first page uh, where we looked at uh, the main problem. Um, so if you look at the main problem, um, just a brief summary of what we've done so far. Uh, we have the following frame. The load distribution, load intensity is not known to us. Uh, we are told information on two sections, one at section BB, one at section AA. In terms of the failure uh, normal stress at AA, failure shear stress at BB. What we do is we go through the process of finding the internal forces on sections AA and BB. We use only those force components that dictate the uh, uh, failure mechanisms. Uh, failure due to normal stresses on AA, failure due to shear stresses on section BB. We make use of that. We find uh, limiting values of Q. We see that Q based on uh, sigma which uh, we obtained from section AA was 9.42. Q based on tau which we used the section BB from was 12.04 kN per meter. We know that obviously the lower of the two is the value that controls failure and so our choice for the load intensity Q is going to be 9.42 kN per meter. Alright, thank you.